Hi, Mr. Morris here with you talking to you about communication systems. As you're aware, communication systems is one of three core topics. And in this vodcast, we'll be talking about examples of communication systems and the issues associated with those systems. A good example of a communication system is the use of teleconferencing and I suppose teleconferencing provides an alternative to a face-to-face -face meeting. The technology for teleconferencing has got a lot better over the years and uh, it's come down incredibly in price. With the advent of things like Skype and three-way conversations with uh, your telephone, this has now become available to the home user as well. As you can understand, for a business purpose, um, generally if people wanted to meet together um, and they were living on opposite sides of the globe, they would have to fly over and book accommodation and the costs for business were uh, very, very high. With teleconferencing now, whether it be via an audio conference or a video conference, people can uh, collaborate using this sort of technology and communicate uh, as a project team. Audio conferencing is an example of teleconferencing and this allows for communications uh, between groups uh, using sound only. Generally what happens is they place a microphone in the middle of a table and that's connected to a specific type of phone and uh, at the other end they do the same thing and it basically means that anyone sitting at the table can uh, say whatever they want to contribute to the conversation and that will then be relayed down the line to the uh, destination or the recipient of that data. The good part about audio conferencing is it is in fact real-time communication which means that as uh, the person is speaking, then obviously a reply can came back, come back instantaneously. Here's a uh, context diagram depicting an audio conference. And you can see that um, in this case we have head office managers, we have a branch manager and a chairman. And they all feed into the system, the circle being the business meeting teleconference system. You can see that uh, their voices of the head office managers are inputs to the system uh, and as are the branch voices and the chairman is relaying instructions down to management etc. And so information flows to the system and from the system to the external entities. Remember context diagrams are a good way of summarising a system such as audio conferencing. So video conferencing, the sort of second example of teleconferencing, and um, as I said in the intro, video conferencing used to be a very, very expensive exercise. With the advent of webcams in most laptops these days and the good quality microphone headsets that you can buy, video conferencing is now available to the home user via the use of things like Skype and MSN uh, chat facilities. So to define it, it is simply a face-to-face -face communication between people in different uh, locations. It can often be used for teaching and learning, so distance education users visit video conferencing all the time, but it's also used for um, collaboration and seeing business counterparts. Now, we know with communication that um, if it was an audio conference, you would lose out on that body language and uh, seeing the reaction of uh, a collaborator with video conferencing, obviously that is um, facilitated so you can see a reaction to maybe a proposal that you uh, include video in your website, for instance, and they might uh, turn their nose up at that and re uh, react disfavorably to your suggestion, but it, it is a useful way to engage in the, in the project work there. Um, as I said, Initially, when video conferencing first came out, you needed very uh, fast computers with lots of RAM and fast processors and huge amounts of bandwidth, internet bandwidth. As I said, with things like Skype, um, it's now available to the general home user and I can see video conferencing only getting better. 
Some of the advantages and disadvantages of teleconferencing in general, the syllabus asks, to con asks us to consider some of these. So if you have a look through those, um, advantages include, you know, there's um, greater productivity, less time is wasted for participants, you know, traveling to and from the, uh, you know, one destination, overseas travel. That obviously decreases costs as well as uh, telephone calls or a video conference is much cheaper than hiring out uh, a conference venue or accommodation and a whole lot of uh, flights, etc. Um, it fa facilitates flexible meeting scheduling. So, you know, if a um, person was in London, then um, people in Australia could, could negotiate a time in which to meet them uh, online. It certainly does achieve worldwide connectivity with the um, global infrastructure that we now have in place, the switching and routing that happens between a whole variety of networks. We have that great facility of being able to teleconference with, uh, with many people. The travel we've spoken about and um, it allows the use of on-site resources not necessarily available at a conference centre. So by that it means if there was a boardroom discussion then um, you know, instead of flying the whole board over to a particular venue with a supplier, they could actually um, you know, use the existing facilities that they have in-house. Disadvantages, uh, you're talking about um, special hardware and software. As I said, that's not so much of an issue anymore. It used to be. Um, I suppose the real high-end video conferencing where you get you know, full high-definition uh, output, yes, it does require special hardware and software. Um, you know, communication may be difficult um, as it is still harder to relate to others in this method of conferencing. You know, you will get uh, people talking over the top of one another if there is a delay. Um, you know, normally business people like to shake um, other people's hands as a way of sort of securing a deal. And, you know, there's, there's sort of, um, you know, a, a connection there, a person-to-person -person connection. So that that is obviously reduced in a teleconference, but you um, will see many businesses these days using this sort of facility just because it does cut down on costs. So we'll go on to messaging systems now, and I suppose um, in our households, one of the traditional types of messaging systems that we use is our, our telephone service, and our telephone is part of what we call the PSTN network, the public switch telephone network. Um, in Australia, uh, Telstra was a government-owned enterprise called Telecom. And um, when they started to uh, roll out copper wires to households, then um, they had a telephone service which, you know, all those copper wires feed back to telephone exchanges. And, um, you know, the, the infrastructure is very, very old, but the, um, the good old telephone service still does a good job. The quality of the calls is very very good and um, you know it, it does the job it is quite still quite expensive in comparison to many other nations but um, we know that telephone systems like the mobile uh, phone network is just going along in leaps and bounds and a lot of people are actually preferring now not to have what we call a landline and that means a, a telephone connected to a phone socket in your house but are going with um, you know mobile phones because they can get uh, you know, fairly cheap plans and, you know, it, there's unlimited phone calls that they can make and with uh, the advent of smartphones now, uh, mobile phones are maybe sometimes preferred because they do a whole lot more than simply just make phone calls. So I think maybe if we were looking at um, emerging technologies, I think maybe the plain, uh, the, sorry, the public switch telephone networks will eventually sort of die out and most of the... Um, Telephone message systems will be via uh, mobiles and via VoIP, which I'll speak about soon. Fax systems, um, yes, businesses still use fax systems, and uh, fax is short for facsimile, spelled F-A-C-S-I-M-I-L-E. And facsimiles basically transmit data in graphical form. If I was to send um, a business a fax, um, it's a special machine and it basically consists of a scanning device. So that's the collection device. It scans an image and digitizes that. And then uh, the hardware inside the fax, which includes a modem, uh, encodes the data into analog or waveform and 
transmit uh, transmits that data along the connection medium, generally being uh, the telephone line, the PSTN network, and that then uh, is received by the uh, destination fax machine, and that does the encoding process and then prints it out. Um, as I said, faxes are still used in businesses, but again, there's a move away from that to scanning to email or um, uh, direct um, transfer of information uh, across uh, across networks. Voicemail is a common messaging service that uh, many businesses use and in fact many households use now. Telstra a couple of years ago released um, an online voicemail service and now most people who have a home telephone don't necessarily need an um, answering machine but have a digital voicemail account. All of the voicemail that comes into your voicemail accounts are generally stored on a server of some kind. So if it's Telstra, they would have a server and the voice is digitized as a audio file, like an MP3. And then when you go and receive that call or retrieve that message, you are actually retrieving an MP3 file and listening to it on your telephone. So voicemail, very, very useful way of um, receiving messages and is another example of a communication system. VoIP. Voice over internet protocol. This is the, the you know, we can't really call this an emerging technology anymore because it is very much here. Uh, many businesses are going with VoIP. In fact, many home users like myself um, have VoIP. And the, I suppose the reason is that it is significantly cheaper than um, a landline, a PSTN telephone. Um, it uses the internet infrastructure. Um, the internet protocol of TCP IP and it basically converts voice um, calls into again analog data and pushes that along the various connection mediums um, cat5 cat6 satellite etc um, VoIP has a whole lot of other functionality too like inbuilt um, inbuilt uh, voicemail etc so um, you know you'll see um, this as becoming pretty much the norm, I think, in the future, rather than the PSTN network and very much used these days for communication. Email. Email's been around for well, a long time now, I think about 25 years, and um, as you know, email is short for electronic mail. Um, it handles a range of different types of data, including text and graphics, and you know, people will often now attach uh, things like audio files and video to an email, but it must be said that you know it was never really designed to transport data of that type. It really was only designed to carry text and graphics in a quick and efficient manner. Um, you know, your email um, size limits are about sort of four to five meg. So I've seen on you know so many occasions students trying to send home an email to themselves with a you know 20 megabyte PowerPoint and it just doesn't doesn't like it doesn't work so um, you know FTP would be a better option for that but um, yeah email is still extensively used in businesses and schools and um, you know all different uh, organizations across the world um, as you know an email address consists of an identifier and a domain name so you know a unique name like Konica and there's always the um, at symbol and then you have a domain name like yahoo.com.au and so no two person to no two people can have the same identifier name but obviously the main name in an organization stays the same one of the issues i suppose with email is that it can be often unsecured and also it can be misinterpreted um, or sent to incorrect recipients there's been a number of court cases whereby uh, people have sent uh, an email and um, it's actually been received by the boss and it was never intended for the boss to receive that but uh, it resulted in um, those people being dismissed um, in terms of being misinterpreted um, as you know when you're talking to someone you um, have facial expressions and body language and things like that and with an email it can it can often be misinterpreted because um, there's no real way of picking up tone I suppose you could say there's you know, you can do smiley faces and you can um, put things in like um, lol and ROFL, but 
Um, there are ways in which um, emails can be misinterpreted. It's very difficult to read tone in an email. So I suppose a word of warning when you're using email to communicate, you just need to be careful about that. In terms of the technical side of things, email makes use of two protocols, that is POP and SMTP. Um, and we'll speak more about those in class. Some of the advantages and disadvantages of email are listed here. Um, many people have uh, web-based email, Hotmail, Gmail, Yahoo Mail, there's loads of examples. Even if you have a, um, an internet service provider like Big Pond or Optus or Dodo or whatever, they generally provide you web-based email as well. And the great benefit of web-based email is that it can be retrieved from any computer anywhere in the world. All you need is basically a web browser and that needs to be connected to the internet. So there's a great benefit in terms of 24-7 um, access to your information. Email addresses can be stored in the user's online account, and I know many of you have um, MSN or Hotmail accounts, so you know that links nicely with MSN, so you've got all your um, address book there. Um, email provides a record of a conversation which can be referred to, and you, know, you can um, go back to that and if there was an issue in terms of miscommunication, then they can be, um, you know, clarified and provides a record of some sort of conversation taking place. It's also a very efficient way to transmit and receive small digital files. And as I said earlier, you wouldn't really send anything greater than five megabytes. A 20 uh, megabyte PowerPoint just won't do it effectively. So, um, yeah, lots of great um, advantages of email, some disadvantages. It can take a long while to transmit if uh, attachments are sizable and the bandwidth is not uh, is not too flash where you're sending it from. Um, emails can often be a um, common source of viruses, especially if we're talking about mass mailing worms that will infect your address book. You need to be really careful with that. So um, later on, we'll talk about some of the issues associated with communication systems like security and having a strong antivirus um, software really does protect you and uh, your computer from it, uh, attracting these sorts of things. It does reduce personal per, uh, person to person contact. Um, you know, we're living in a society now where we're relying on a great deal of technologies like MSN, like SMS, like email, and uh, you know, there's often a need to basically talk face to face with a person. So we should never ever underestimate that importance of that. Um, as we've said earlier, misunderstanding and misinterpretation could take place, and I know many arguments have commenced over email because you know someone has simply been misinterpreted. Okay, uh, one of your favourite um, forms of communication, internet relay chat or IRC as it's commonly known, or chat. Um, a good example is obviously MSN Messenger, which I know many of you actually use, provided by Microsoft, and. It tends to be um, a preferred method of communication these days because it seems uh, more instantaneous than email. It's still not totally, um, you know, full duplex. That is, two people typing simultaneously on the same screen. You're basically seeing that, but it is more instantaneous than uh, than email. And uh, with the functionality now, like in Skype and MSN, where you can share files and you can um, you know, view a common message board or whatever, there's great benefit for a project team in terms of using chat and you'll often see organisations use a, a, a locally um, hosted in-house in chat rather than using something like MSN, but you know, lots of businesses I suppose use MSN because it's cheap and or basically free and um, you know, very useful to communicate. All right, we'll move on to um, examples of e-commerce now and e-commerce has really exploded with the um, you know with the evolution of the internet and global networking and um, the many rollout of um, fiber optic cables all throughout the United States and transatlantic cables to India etc has really facilitated you know speedy access to information and um, opened up global communities to uh, online commerce and electronic commerce and so 
for, for the definition, it's just the use of electronic communication to conduct business online. Uh, many examples, buying a, a train ticket from a kiosk, using a website to book an airline ticket and, um, or a, you know, concert ticket, gathering product information from a company's website and you know, withdrawing money from an automatic teller machine. FPOS is another example of electronic commerce that we'll talk about in a moment. So FPOS stands for Electronic Funds Transfer at Point of Sale and um, in Australia FPOS is a very, very commonly used form of e-commerce. Um, basically the way it works is that you go into a store and the store generally pay, uh, pays a provider like the Commonwealth Bank or National Australia Bank to host uh, their FPOS terminal for them and uh, they would swipe your card which has a magnetic strip on the back and you choose a uh, what type of account you have, savings, check or credit and you're then prompted to put in a PIN or sign depending on what type of transaction you're completing. Now um, there's a misconception with FPOS that it actually happens in real time, the money transfers from the um, customer's account to the um, store's account in real time, that's actually incorrect. It sits in a holding account with the bank and generally takes a day to transfer over. However, the money will be um, removed from the customer's account so that if you know they went to then pull out more money and they uh, did not have any funds then they wouldn't be able to do that. Most stores have um, FPOS and in fact New Zealand is the highest user of FPOS um, given that you know the, the, the costs involved are fairly negligible over there. Internet banking or electronic banking is another common uh, form of e-commerce and over the years electronic banking has um, attracted its critics. Um, people have criticised it because they believe that it wasn't a safe way of banking and I've said in class before that the internet was never really designed as a banking tool but uh, many banks have decided to use that um, primarily because it decreases costs, you know, setting up branches and paying tellers etc. But it also uh, enables um, people to bank online 24-7 and that's the great advantage of electronic banking. Um, there are some things that you, know, you can't do online, like make uh, cash deposits, etc. But you can uh, transfer money across to other accounts, and with the functionality of BPay and internal credits, there's a great deal of um, things that you can still do online. Um, one of the, as I said, great dangers of electronic banking, and people are quite scared of you know using it, is this um, issue of security and. As you may be aware, um, the um, use of the use of uh, secure socket layer um, is really important in terms of uh, ensuring that the transaction is safe and secure. A secure socket layer uses 128-bit uh, data encryption. So, uh, when a person logs onto a website, a um, public key is sent to the website and then a private key is negotiated during that handshaking process between the user and the uh, website and once the private key is established um, it's recognized by the browser and so therefore whatever information is transmitted and received during that session it's basically encrypted so if it was to be intercepted along the way then it would not be able to be read um, there's a great deal of technology involved in that, but um, that's a bit beyond the scope of the course. All that we need to know is that SSL, or Secure Socket Layer, is used in many of these examples like internet banking. And generally a way of telling um, that there is an encrypted tunnel is that a little padlock appears on your uh, web browser. Okay, I'd like to move on to the issues associated with communication systems now and um, if you were to look at your syllabus there are a number of issues that I mentioned and we're going to deal with them fairly briefly but I'll give you plenty of examples of um, you know, sorts of things that you 
should really know in relation to um, communication systems. So you can see them on your screen there, security, globalization, the changing nature of work, the effect on interpersonal relationships, um, the whole evolution of e-crime and uh, cyber criminals, what's happening out there and why they're doing it. Uh, we'll talk about legal implications as a result of communication systems and these virtual communities that are popping up everywhere. So this idea of security um, can be looked at from a personal perspective or a corporate perspective. And it's all about keeping the data secure during the communication process. As you know, in the uh, communication framework, we have a source and we have a destination. And as the information gets transmitted, it goes through potentially a whole lot of different types of networks in the switching and routing phase. And you know, eventually it will get to its destination. But um, you know, quite often in the transmission of, of um, important data or confidential data, then it needs to be uh, secured in some way. And we spoke uh, before in terms of e-commerce that secure socket layer or, um, is used to secure transaction data in e-commerce. And the idea is that during that transmission process, um, there is encryption that occurs and decryption that occurs at the other end and information cannot be hacked into or um, put back together during that process. One way to keep um, your personal computer or your corporate computer uh, safe is to have antivirus software and I don't think there would be any organisation that wouldn't have antivirus software with um, the computers fairly tightly monitored by um, IT staff. Antivirus software protects um, users from things like viruses and we know that pretty much every day there's you know, 5 to 10, 15, 20 new viruses that are written, some of greater severity than others. There's things like malware, you know, uh, malicious software it's basically short for and it can do a whole lot of um, bad things to your computer. I had a, a student come and see me recently and it basically hijacked her whole operating system so we pretty much had to wipe it and start again. So really good to have up to date any of our software to stop things like that. Uh, Trojans, a Trojan is a, a, I suppose, a type of virus that basically infiltrates your system. And if you're familiar with the, the Greek mythological story of the Trojan horse, and you know, all the soldiers hid inside the horse and it made its way into the, um, into the city. I think it was Troy, I could be wrong. Um, and they all hopped out and you know uh, started a big fight and killed a whole lot of people. The the principle is the same, you know. The the Trojan virus infects your computer and then um, you know it propagates a whole lot of other little programs that sit in the background of computer your computer and you would never know that they were there, but can do a whole lot of really nasty things like record keystrokes and report them back to a website. And you know if you're doing internet banking, for instance, that would be particularly bad news because they could then have your password or your um, access to a whole lot of other things online like your MSN account or Facebook account or whatever. Um, worms are particularly bad as well and um, I know some of you have spoken to me about the different um, worms that can get into your system. Basically what happens is that if you have MSN or you have an address book in Outlook it will um, essentially send a virus out to everyone within your address book and if you open the particular virus from the person that sent it to you then it propagates through your whole address book and sends out to all of the recipients in your address book. So um, a friend of mine had one recently and I got a whole lot of emails from him and he eventually had to shut his, his email account down. It was an MSN account. So security very very important with relation to communication systems and you know, you will be asked in exams to comment on security and how organisations and um, people keep their data secure and safe online. E-crime sort of fits into security as well because a lot of people, I suppose, prey on the lack of knowledge that some people have with technology and, um, you know, then they are subject to internet crime or like electronic crime. Internet fraud, as you can see there, encompasses many examples, like phishing, um, 
where a, um, a bogus email is sent out purporting to be a bank and they try and get you to offer up your data. Um, a rule of thumb, banks will very, very rarely, if ever, send you an email. So um, you never respond to anything like that. You simply delete it. Spam messages, you know, massive mail outs of um, inappropriate messages or messages trying to get you to go to a link and quite often there'll be malicious software like malware that it will then load. Um, and we've all seen those little pop-ups that are annoying and we always want to get rid of. Um, one of the things that's really common these days is identity theft. So people are really warned to, you know, keep your passwords, your MSN passwords or your Facebook passwords secure and, you know, have different passwords for different things and really safeguard your data. It's really important to keep your data private because people can then, you know, assume your identity and go and open bank accounts and form a whole lot of illegal actions under your identity and then it becomes a real hassle for you to do to sort of clear that mess up. Skimming of cards um, is quite popular at the moment. A lot of banks are reporting that um, in fact you know, little um, dummy tellers are set up on an ATM and they're reading the magnetic stripe of a card and then there's a little dummy keypad that's connected somehow to a computer system and people are getting um, information from um, unsuspecting users about that and then creating cards and basically fleecing people of their money so always a word of warning make sure you check at the ATM that it looks quite authentic and um, you know cover up your pin when you put it into the keypad one of the most frightening things is the online grooming of young people um, you know that's uh, very much a scary thing that we're dealing with these days of you know um, pedophiles etc trawling the internet and trying to get young people to uh, meet up with them or provide details to them or you know um, you know view them on a webcam etc so um, that's something that you know communication systems um, and law enforcement agencies will really need to be aware of going forward in the future with the rollout of fiber, transatlantic fiber optics and the improvement in satellite communications, etc., this um, globalization, the world has got a lot, lot smaller. According to uh, Thomas Friedman, he wrote a book, a book called The World is Flat. And he spoke about, you know, the world is no longer, um, you know, millions of kilometers apart. It's very, very close via the use of communication systems and technologies. So, you know, uh, world trade and global companies are far easier to set up these days. And, you know, there's great evidence to say that, you know, major technology companies like HP and IBM, etc., when you ring for technical support, you're being redirected to India. Um, you know, so that the many companies now um, set up global um, networks and global organisations. And um, I know in Australia, for instance, Telstra um, and Linksys both um, use the Philippines for call centers because obviously the labor is cheap over there. So, you know, the world is um, contracting in terms of communication systems. There are many legal implications associated with um, use of communication systems. And one of the great challenges is how do you deal with that on an international scale? Obviously, um, laws um, are applied to each particular country, but when you're um, using communication systems or conducting e-commerce online like you know amazon.com for instance um, it's very difficult to enforce a law that is you know international so um, you know governments have very little control over international trade that is conducted online and so um, there are sort of legal implications there uh, the workforce is definitely changing and we now live in a world where um, occupations change daily, the way we work changes daily and you know communication can be instantaneous in around the world in a matter of minutes. Uh, many people are um, sort of being redeployed or moving out of a um, particular type of employment and freed up to, to do different things and maybe be creative in what they do. Many lecturers at university have had to sort of change the way they do things and as teachers we're constantly changing the way we're doing things and our job is changing as a result of communication you know, being available to students online and uh, via email and parents online and via email is definitely changing our work practice and 
I know at university how many um, lecturers podcast their lectures and make them available to students as, as soon as the lecture is finished. So that's very much a, a change in, in the way we work. Um, many people can actually telecommute, that is working from home. And there are great benefits there environmentally, you know, less cars on the road, less pollution, and uh, there's cost benefits too in terms of maintaining a vehicle. So there are many people that work from home now as a result of you know being able to get onto their um, corporate network from home via the use of an internet link. Interpersonal relationships have definitely been affected by um, online and communication systems. Um, people say that um, you know person-to-person -person relationships have decreased. You know people would much rather send a text message now as opposed to talk to someone, and so yeah, that is, that is quite true. Um, what one thing we would always say though is you know non-direct contact like via an SMS or via an email or via an internet relay chat can result in misinterpretation and maybe some of us have actually been subject to misinterpret interpret emails before and it's not very nice you sort of have to you know go and apologize and maybe try and rectify the situation the other thing is this whole idea of online dating has become very popular and um, you know, how has this idea of an interpersonal relationship changed as a result of communication systems with people? You know, there's using sites like rsvp.com and, you know, live chat functionality and, you know, posting photos up there of yourself and, you know, choosing different people that you might want to go and have dinner with, etc. So the way we um, interrelate with one another is definitely changing as a result of communication systems. So... That's pretty much a wrap up of uh, communication systems in general and some of the issues that uh, we face when using communication systems. Um, I hope this podcast has been of some use and I hope it helps you in your revision of this particular unit. Thanks and bye.